Back in 1979, there was a product called VisiCalc for the Apple II, and it was basically known as the killer app for the Apple II. Uh, Steve Jobs himself actually said that it was VisiCalc which made the Apple II the, uh, the winning original 8-bit microcomputer. VisiCalc was a visual calculator, or specifically as we know them today, a spreadsheet. There have been two real explosions that have propelled the industry forward. The first one uh, really happened in 1977, and it was the spreadsheet. I remember when uh, Dan Feilstra, who ran the company that marketed the first spreadsheet, walked into my office at Apple one day and pulled out this disk from this uh, vest pocket and said, I, I have this incredible new program. I call it a visual calculator, and it became VisiCalc. And that's what really drove, propelled the Apple II to, to the success it, it achieved. On the PC, uh, when it first started out, the IBM PC, that is specifically, the piece of software which became the market leader wasn't VisiCalc. VisiCalc kind of languished for a while there. And what took over in its stead was Lotus 1.2.3. It was an improved spreadsheet package from Lotus. <laughs> Richard, I want that report ready in five minutes. Okay, okay. Yesterday all I felt was tired But suddenly I'm re-inspired I'm making music on my PC. It's really simple with one, two, three. I'm learning how to use its power and speed. I finally found myself the disc I need. Baby, I'm becoming a PC whiz. Cause now I know with Lotus how easy it is. Lotus, many, many years later, were actually bought out by IBM. But in the meantime, in the 1980s, it was a very, very popular product and really took advantage of all the extra processing power and memory that the IBM PC had. It could address mainly up to 640K of RAM and had a processing clock not of 1 megahertz, but of, uh, I think, 4.77 megahertz. So it was a faster machine well, at least in numbers in any case. So it was a great product. It was really important for the market, especially in the early days of the IBM PC to get that foothold. But it was also um, a product which was continually developed by Lotus. And as they developed it for new features, it really became quite a difficult beast to make sure that it could perform in what became a limitation of the IBM PC. You know, 640K sounded like a lot of memory back in 1981, but by the end of the 1980s, well, that wasn't so much memory after all. When you were working on, on large workbooks of maybe multiple workbooks, it was really actually a bit of a drag. So computers at that time were looking at the 286 or maybe even the 386 processor and more memory. It was a bit of a challenge to make sure that the early audience of the PC were accommodated for. So what Lotus made sure of is that the uh, older PC generation worked as well as the newer PC generation. I meet here with Bert Bruce, who talks about his time with Lotus, working on the development team of the product that became Lotus 1.2.3 version 3.0. Okay, so I'm joined here today by Bert Bruce, uh, who worked uh, in the 1980s in a company called Freelance, but then went on to work with a very well-known company, Lotus. Um, and so, um, Bert, I'll let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background before you before you went off to join Lotus on their biggest, their flagship product, really, which was Lotus One Two Three. Well, uh, my background—I uh, actually, my degrees uh, are in chemistry, not in computer science. I discovered computers while I was working on a master's degree in chemistry, doing computational chemistry. Discovered that uh, programming was much more fun than chemistry, and so uh, uh, abandoned that uh, that that 
career track and ended up uh, becoming a programmer. Started out with IBM for a couple of years. Uh, went on to a, a small startup called Computer Vision, which developed the first commercially we developed the first commercially successful CAD system uh, based on mini computers. Uh, this was in 1971. I worked in in that business for uh, in the, the computer design business for the next 10 or 15 years uh, between Computer Vision and Digital Equipment Corporation, doing CAD kind of applications. Uh, got into, into the PCs really. Uh, my first job in, in the PC industry was with a small company called Graphic Communications. And with, with Graphic Communications, we developed an interactive graphics package, sort of a, a, a CAD program for, for uh, business users, if you will, computer, computer aided design for business. Uh, an early uh, presentation graphics, interactive graphics package. It was called Freelance. The product was Freelance. Uh, and uh, that product uh, made some nice decisions that made it uh, very compatible with uh, Lotus 123. And uh, we were located in suburban Boston. Uh, Lotus was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, they liked the product. They came and evaluated the product, liked it, and ended up buying the company. So I got to Lotus basically by being acquired by Lotus in their efforts to uh, expand their product base away from just the spreadsheet product. Yeah, and, um, and whilst you were there building the, uh, working with the, the freelance team on that, that freelance product, it's true that one of your team uh, had disassembled the, the binary code uh, within the Lotus 123 product. And that, that individual had actually, you know, by through by disassembly, had, had worked out how the graphing routines had worked in 123, is that right? That's correct. He, he looked at the at the, the binary code that they used to produce a graph, figured out what were the, the lines, what were circles, what was text, and so forth, to create the drawing. And so we were able then to uh, uh, to read a Lotus graph, uh, the, the the file that Lotus would produce to, to generate a, a, a chart or a graph. We were able to read it into one two three, and then use it to. Uh, to put it into our presentation, annotate it, uh, add arrows to point out significant things or add text to the graph or whatever, and, and to really customize the graph for a presentation. I think that was one of the features that, that the, the Lotus team really liked. Uh, it also made our menu structure very similar to the Lotus menu structure. So it felt like part of a, a Lotus product right from the start. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, they acquired us and we became the, the graphics products division of, of Lotus development. Uh, and I think that was probably in early 1986. Yeah, that must have been quite a challenge to disassemble that code. I mean, it's certainly something that, you know, engineers these days don't generally have to do. Um, you know, look at compiled binary blobs to work out how things work. But back in those days, that, that could be a, not a common practice, but certainly something that if you wanted to get self into intelligence on the way a product worked, that was something you might have to do. So it must have been quite a challenge. Yes, it was. As I said, it was a very bright young engineer. And uh, uh, he, uh, uh, knowing what the graph looked like, you sort of have to, to infer based upon the, the looking at the binaries what what that must mean. It, it, it took a little, uh, a, a little, quite a bit of work. I was, uh, it was something he actually did on his own. Uh, he came to me one day and said, hey, look what I've done. And I said, wonderful. <laughs> Let's put it in the product. And it, uh, and it worked it worked out very well for all of us. So that's, that's great. That's a real good story. Um, so obviously, uh, fast forward a few months, um, you've been, your company was acquired there by Lotus. And you found yourself um, smack bang in, in the engineering team uh, of Lotus. Now, what sort of version of one, two, three? What type uh, was it? Version one, version two? We're about in this sort of timeline. Was 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 it that you you were starting to find yourself? Well, we were, when we were acquired, uh, when we were acquired, uh, one uh, one two three version two point two was actually the, uh, the the product that was shipping right then. Um, and in, in my opinion, I think that the uh, 
that version of one, two, three had very much to do with the success of the PC over the years. I, I would guess that more PCs were bought in the mid eighties, mid to late eighties to run one, two, three than practically any other product in the world. Yeah. Uh, Lotus at that point, we had a, there was one group that was working on a Macintosh version. Uh, there was another group that, that was, uh, working on, a, on the next generation, the one, two, the, the version three, uh, we had we were a separate division working just on our own products. So there were a number of different uh, products going on, and uh, OS2 was had been announced, uh, I think in '86, and there was a started up a group that was going to build a, a an OS2 presentation manager version of one two three. So there were a number of different versions, different groups within Lotus working on development. I mean, I I remember. Uh, using i think it was probably lotus 123 version 3 but certainly it felt like at the time you know in the sort of mid 1980s perhaps uh lotus 123 was the killer app and um you know going back a bit in time you know so it was a killer app for the pc but going back in time into the sort of late 70s and early 80s physicalc was the product that won the killer app for probably the Apple II computers, you know, it was on the Apple II first, right. um, and so you you know a little bit about how you know Lotus became the dominant force there on the on the iPhone PC, which you know I guess had more memory. It could address um, give or take up to six hundred forty kilobytes of RAM, whereas the the Apple II I think was sixty four and maybe later one hundred twenty eight k. But it wasn't it wasn't the same amount of memory, and there was a lot of more constraints on it, but. BusyCalc was that killer app for the Apple II, but then Lotus One Two Three became the killer app for um, for for the PC. So can you talk a little bit about that. The stories that I heard back, uh, back then, uh, with, uh, Mitch Kapor started Lotus, okay, uh, and and he had seen BusyCalc. Uh, uh, basically. My understanding of version one of, of one, two, three was actually written by a single guy, uh, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Sachs, who was still at Lotus when I was there. I met him a couple of times. He was then working on a word processor. Lotus tried to have its own word processor called Manuscript. Uh, uh, one of the biggest issues in those days for uh, graphics word processing and the like was the, the, the very limited graphics capabilities on the PC. Uh, it was fine for, for text arrays, like for a spreadsheet, but those were the days of the CGA and the EGA where the graphics adapters and they're very low resolution. So you couldn't, couldn't do a lot of, uh, of, of nice fancy text fonts and word processors and things like that. So, uh, uh, John, uh, had, uh, had written one, uh, version one, a team of about 10 guys did version two. Uh, uh, it was all written in IBM, uh, in PC assembler, in 88 assembler, uh, not in any high level language. And uh, it was it was put together by a team, I think maxed out at about 10 people to, to get that done. Uh, uh, and, and this was now, we're, we're talking late, you know, mid to late eighties, before the 386 really became popular uh, or was available uh, and so there were a lot of a lot of constraints that were were held as in your earlier video that I had responded to uh, that, 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 that 640k constraint was uh, uh, was a major constraint I think on on all software uh, PC software development in that, in that time frame uh, until 386 and Windows, you know, well, the, the 286 uh, and, and did have extendable memory, so you could run a 286 with, and get beyond that 640K limit. But again, we're talking, I guess the two, I'm trying to remember, the 286 was 85, maybe, you know, when it came out. Okay, so there weren't a lot of 286 machines. The bulk of machines were still uh, the original 88. Uh, uh, architecture machines that were, were running MS-DOS in those days. The group had started to develop uh, the release three and originally the release three group started with about 10 guys as well. They were going to rewrite uh, release two. They were going to write a, a, a 3D spreadsheet, multi-sheet multi, multi -sheet, 
uh, version of, of one, two, three, um, with some extra features, uh, it was all going to be written in the C, it was written in the C language, not in, in the assembly, uh, for portability to allow it to be used in other, that code to be used in other environments other than MS-DOS. Um, and, uh, had, a, had quite a, quite a large number of, uh, of difficult goals, uh, and ultimately, the uh, the uh, the goals were so uh, so large that they were not able to fit into a <laughs> into a 640k machine. What happened uh, as the as the product was being developed, the team grew and grew. It started out as 10 people. Uh, by 1986, I think it was up to about 50 people uh, in the development group uh, trying to, to work on various parts of the of the code. Uh, and it was very late uh, from the original schedule. Lotus had hired a new development VP to run all of the development organizations um, from IBM. He did a review of the uh, of the project. I was asked to be on the review team uh, as as the head of of the development for the graphics group, and. Uh, uh, I would talk in, that, in the review. I talked about how the kind of scheduling techniques I was and design techniques I was using in my group. And uh, so, the, at the end of the review, when we said talked about what needed to be done for this project that was running very late, the uh, the new VP said, "Well, why don't you take over the project?" Uh, uh, and in retrospect, uh, I have to say it was probably the biggest mistake of my life. It was uh, naive, I think, because I, I should have dug more deeply and realized that uh, uh, the project was probably untenable the way it was designed and built. They did not have sufficient detailed schedules, de detailed design, and were just sort of working really hard at getting things done. Uh, I ran that project for a year trying to get it to stuffed into a uh, into a 640k machine and we never could do it when it when the uh, uh even before i joined the team when uh when it, the code got bigger than 640k uh they everybody switched to os2 which had just come out which would was running on 286 machines uh and could run you know greater than a than a meg and uh, they all just developed a code that was bigger and it would fit in 640k with the idea that we'd use a a, a, a linker. There was a a, a linker a, a overlay a linker at the time called PLink86, uh, and you could divide your code into into chunks to be overlaid into the upper part of the 640k. Uh, and we tried it. Then the goal was to okay write the code to be bigger than 640K and then figure out a way of partitioning it to fit into that by using overlays. Uh, it was never possible to do that. We could never come up with a structure that would satisfy all and everybody's needs. So uh, in the end, after a year of, of trying to do this, in the end, uh, the product was never able to ship at uh, in, for a, in a 640K machine. So that major goal, which would had been sort of the the, uh, the the main thing that we were trying to do with the product never never was able to happen, and it did shift eventually, but it you know it would only run on on larger machines on two eighty sixes and three eighty sixes. That's but incredible. We were. I, did, I didn't actually know that. I thought that uh, version three went on and 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 operated on um, eighty eighty eights with no, it, um, did not. it did not the six forty Ks. Uh, so the version I obviously ran back in the day uh, when I was uh, a grasshopper was obviously version two point something because I'm, I'm I'm definite it was on an XT with less than a megabyte of RAM. So okay. if it, if it was running on an XT, it had to be a, a version two point two. Yeah, yeah. So um, how how long had the project been going before you were involved in it? It has been gone, and I think it was about a year and a half or more. I, and it, it, it may be even, even be more than that when, when I got involved. Um, and I was in, I ran it for a year uh, after that. And, and we finally had to just give up on, on that as uh, on, on the, the, the 8088 architecture as, as, the, as the target because it, it wouldn't fit. 
with C, of course, provided a certain amount of overhead. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that that, that we tried to, to get it crammed down. We, we tried to bugger with this, the C compiler and see if we could generate better code, more efficient code from the C compiler. But uh, there was there was just, as I said, the, the, between the C compiler, the linker, and other things, we were just never able to to, to get it small enough to to fit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess that must have been quite a, a, a blow for um, for Lotus because even though it was, you know, becoming a, it was clear that it was dead, uh, the 8088 and, and, and the 640K and all that. I mean, that was, you know, definitely not the way that the industry was, you know, the norm was in, in sort of the late 80s. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a crucial time, actually. I mean, it, it was a, a, a real transition time. Uh, from 87, 88 on, I guess, simply because the 386, when with, along with the 386 became the possibility of, of doing Windows. Uh, yeah. And uh, at, at the time, we're talking about, I mean, one of the other projects going on was, was to do a version for OS2. Uh, the OS2 had a, a graphics interface called Presentation Manager. Uh, and, and there was a team that was, developing uh, one, two, three, four presentation manager. And again, that was for, for the larger architectures, obviously not for the 8088. Uh, and and I think there was an anticipation that that was going to be the next big operating system. Okay. I have a bug in my collection, uh, which says, says on it, uh, Microsoft OS2, which most people have forgotten because most people think OS2 was an IBM operating system yeah before. but it wasn't it was a joint it was a joint collaboration wasn't it right it was originally joint operation i went remember going to a, a the introduction uh, in new york city they had a, a big conference which i think where i got the mug um and the, between ibm and, and microsoft and then eventually microsoft said no look we're not going to go that route we're going with windows and and gave ibm the rights to os2 and, and they continued on with that product as, a, as, as their own higher end mm. product. Uh, but of course, uh, Windows won out the end and uh, not many people <laughs> ended up using OS2. It's a Windows. good thing that Lotus did both an OS2 and a Windows version then, I guess. But yeah, I mean, back in the day, uh, even as late as this, as the sort of early 90s, so we're talking probably 91, 92, maybe even 93, um, I still recall ads in magazines that you could buy an 8088 class Turbo XT. So they might go 10 megahertz-ish in, in speed, but you uh, you were probably limited unless you had one of those AST ones with the sort of six pack plus cards or whatever, but you're probably still limited to that 640K. And in any case, the constructs of MS-DOS and that sort of stuff were, were you know, you would you'd write in segments of 64K um, and, you know, your allocation of memory in the in the original 8088 anyway was a one megabyte maximum right and and anything above 640k i think was reserved memory in any case for things like the display must have been a real um downer i guess to to find at that point where you there was this all of this installed base of hardware users all these people out in the in the world that still were were holding on especially small businesses they're holding the 8088 well up until the late 80s or even early 90s that must be a bit of a bummer yeah it was of course lotus uh, uh was part of an effort in, uh, to design an extended memory architecture if you recall there was what, what was called limb spec memory limb. remember that lotus yeah. and microsoft uh, sort of uh, joined together to specify a, an architecture for extended memory but again you had to have the right machines to be able to, to do that okay uh, to, to use that memory in the right way, and uh, and I mean that was a, an attempt, an interim attempt uh, before the 386 came out, which allowed much more memory <laughs> uh, uh, it, directly, rather than going through a, a memory manager. I mean, you know, from a programming point of view, memory managers are a hassle because it requires you not just not to write 
just write plain code, but you have to write code that's aware of the fact that it's got to be overlaid and, and the, the code has to be aware of the, of the extended memory and, and deal with it directly rather than just write the code that you're to solve the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, yeah. So it was a, a, it was a, an interim solution that all of it disappeared pretty quickly as we got into the 90s. In retrospect, if IBM had decided to go with like the 68,000 architecture, which, which was a, a full 32-bit architecture from the start, uh, as, as did the Macintosh, for example, uh, life would have been much, much better uh, for, for all of us programmers because I mean, we wouldn't have had, had to deal with any of these limitations. Uh, and I think you covered some of that in your in your video about why they didn't choose the 68K. Uh, and uh, it's uh, too bad. It was I once heard someone say that that, that and, and this was at that time in the, in the late 80s probably that the IBM's decision to to go with the, the Intel architecture was maybe the most expensive decision in the, <laughs> ever made in the history of mankind. Uh, I'm not sure whether that was true, but for a while it, it was very expensive and certainly was expensive to me, to my mental health. Uh, yeah, I, 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 and that brings me to my next point, really. I mean, yes, Intel made that decision. And, and like you say, I, I did sort of wax lyrical on that in the, in the documentary I did um, on the decision to, to go with the Intel architecture. But, um, you know, it's not just about a technical thing. It's about the the drain on human emotions. And, you know, there you are yourself uh, in a situation where you had been foisted into this project at least a year or a year and a half in, where it was already in disarray and you became the, the vice president or, or, you know, the leader in this project. Um, and that took, that must have taken a toll on you but also must have taken a toll on the greater team. Um, I mean, this is this is a problem that's not new. Um, now it's it's still a problem to, to this very day in, in, in software development. It, it can be really, really crushing. But back then, when you had so many real serious limitations, both in the hardware and, and in and the software design perspective, can you tell us a bit about you know what what the feelings were in the team and about the sort of impact that you reckon that it had on you, and and what things you've learned from that that you probably would do differently now given given that circumstance? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I think the whole team. I mean, there were, uh, I think there were about fifty developers in the team at the time, and there were maybe seventy five QA people. Uh, and I think most people were working 80 hours a week. I mean, we work at least six days a week all the time uh, and, and long days uh, because uh, it, it was just, there was a lot to be done and then we were just trying to cram it in. There was a deadline that we'd put in place when, uh, uh, when I first got onto the project uh, uh, and they had no schedule whatsoever at that time. Uh, no real hard schedule. I put in place, a, a, I got all the managers to to say, okay, what are the tasks that have to be done? What they're going to take to get them done? And we put the, 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 put it together in a timeline. I was actually using a, a project scheduling tool called Timeline at the time, which created kind of a, a per chart of, of, of what had to be done. Uh, but, uh, we had the, the deadline was to get it done by the end of the year. Uh, Perk chart said, if everything goes right, we can get it done by the end of the year. But of course, everything hasn't ever could go right. So, uh, uh, so we fought that thing all along. But it uh, uh, and and worked. Everybody worked very very hard to try to, to get it done. Uh, and there was an awful lot of burnout uh, over the over the time that over that year. Uh, <laughs> we were. Uh, we used a, a source code management system. I don't remember. It wasn't SCCS. I forget what the source code management system we were using at the time. But if, if you remember those kinds of things, uh, they're like a library. You, you check out your code and you check it back in again, you know, when you've modified it to keep people from two, two different people from cha changing this code at the same time. Anyway, I had a sign on my office door that, uh, 
sort of express what was going on in the project because it was the last line from Hotel California. If you remember the line, last line from Hotel California, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. And they, they, <laughs> so apt. <laughs> that was the uh, sort of the way the project ran. Okay. Uh, and uh, so it, it was, it, it took a great deal, it took a great toll on all of us. And, and I think, you know, it's, there were some some very if if we had made the goal there were some rewards that were there that, for the team uh, that, that would have been quite quite nice uh, uh, but we were not able to to achieve those rewards you know to get that because we weren't able to get it done at, at, at the time allotted so it was just it was a burnout project and I I have to admit that uh, when after that at that point I, I ended up leaving Lotus and and, uh, and going into a another very a different kind of a of a business but uh, uh but it took me a while to recover from uh, from that burnout and i suspect that it was true from from many members of that team i think because it was it was hard i mean it, it, it's it's not unusual in, in the software business to, to do that uh for shorter stretches of time i, I, I uh, well we developed the first cad system with uh, over it, we really had to write it over like a four month time frame and, and it was the same kind of 9800 hours a week for over four months uh, uh, and, and got it done. Uh, but it, when it drags out much more than that, it, 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 it really is a, it's a burnout kind of a thing. And I, it was too bad because it was uh, with better planning, with better design off the start, uh, we could have come up with with uh, one of two things. Either it's it, it's not going to work in the first place. You know, you could have seen that by by, by doing a better upfront design, uh, or realizing how long it was really going to take, okay, and, and dealing with it that way. There's a there's a, a phenomenon that uh, I kind of realized uh, uh, later on that I wish I'd known at the time about the. Uh, what I would call the non-linearity of complexity. Uh, if you have a project that one guy can do in a year, okay, and you say, okay, now let's let's double the complexity so two guys can do it in a year. No, that's not true because there's interactions between the two and and, and interactions in the more difficult code. So you, it maybe you get, it take you know, it takes you a year and a half to do that project. Okay, when you get ten people to do something. Now you're maybe uh, you're, you're not ten times as efficient. You're maybe three or four times as efficient. Com at, and uh, it's, complexity is very highly non nonlinear. And the more things, the more difficult the project becomes. Uh, throwing more people at it just doesn't help. Okay, and it uh, and uh, it, you, you you reach something that becomes asymptotic. It just can't be done if it gets too complex. And, I often uh, wonder, and and, and I. I totally get that, but my my wonder is that is is that something that it's uh, is actually being understood or at least uh, contemplated before modern day uh, software development and other non software development projects because I I think that makes perfect sense um, that the the more people you get into the mix on a project. The, uh, the, I mean, the, there is an adage, you know, more cooks, you know, too many cooks spoil the broth. You know, it, it, I wonder often if, if that's the sort of thing that's that's considered before embarking on these very complex projects. Um, and it's great to hear the the, the knowledge and the experience that um, you've got from that. Well, for me, for me, I mean, my years in the software business were mostly in smaller companies, where mostly we were under the gun all the time. Okay, so. Uh, for me personally, uh, I kind of burned out at 55. I retired at 55, um, and uh, uh, because I was just mentally, I think, uh, you know, emotionally burned out from always being late, always being under the gun, uh, and and often in small companies, it, it's it's the result of of the founder uh, being way too ambitious. A lot of small entrepreneurial companies, you know get started, make it with one product, then think, okay, now we can do a much bigger product and make a lot more money, you know, so just 
it's just the same thing as what we already did and it isn't okay and the pressure is high and organization was concerned it was a great place to work um it was uh, a, a very open organization uh a very caring organization in terms of, of of taking care of people and uh and communicating very well we had monthly meetings for the entire company and we, we there was a, a hotel right next to the, the headquarters building uh, i think it was actually attached and then there was a big we'd go into the big ballroom there and the entire company would be there to get the presentation. So it was very different in, in structure and attitude to, to companies like IBM that, uh, that, uh, that are a lot more compartmentalized. Okay. Uh, it was, everybody was allowed to get up and speak. Uh, new employees were introduced at every, at the company meetings, each manager would get up and, and introduce the new, the new people they had hired and so forth. Uh, they're very supportive of uh, gay rights and things like that early on, I think, as a, as, as a company. And I think that was, uh, that was the good side. Okay, it was really, it, they were really uh, a very, uh, it was a very progressive place to work. Uh, I think it was just, well, I, uh, uh, another story when we were first acquired by lotus uh we went to a, they were having a party for uh, maybe it was the 2.2 shipping party or something like that in cambridge so we that was the first time that we actually went in we that is graphic communications personnel went in into cambridge and met uh, you know were part of the lotus team and my reaction to that and at this point uh, how old was I? Let's say this was uh, so. I was I was in my forties at that time. Okay, um, uh, but my reaction is we're watching the people around us and, and having drinking beer or whatever, saying, "By God, we've been bought by a bunch of kids." I mean, it was just you know, the, 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 all of the people there were very young, which of course was, was pretty common. I think you know when you think about it in the PC days because all the the old timers were working on mainframes and, and, and larger computers. And, uh, uh, and it was the, the kids coming out of school that were, then let's try this new PC thing. That, that, that's fun, you know, the one step up from the, the Apple II and the, and, the, and the Atari and the other game machines. And, and so, so it, was, it was a very young, but by the same token, inexperienced set of people who hadn't learned yet uh, uh, the difficulties in, in, in large scale project development, you know, and for small scale projects, it was great. But, but as we try to get into bigger things, uh, uh, larger scale projects, that the discipline, the, the experience wasn't there to say, you know, you can't, you can't, you, you gotta be a lot more structured in order to, 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 to get these bigger things done. And, and, uh, they're naive in that regard. So, yeah. Yeah, I often wonder as well. I mean, we, we, we talk about having structure and, um, you know, all this rigidity around projects to aid in, in the lessening of um, you know, product, projects going wayward, uh, such as things like um, Agile, uh, you know, Scrum methodology, and, and then the evolution of that, and the things like Scaled Agile and so forth. Um, but the reality that I've seen, and maybe this is not true of what you might know, but the reality of what I've seen is that I still see engineers being burnt out, being uh, working crazy hours and, and you know, having to make do with, in situations which are less than ideal. So all of these frameworks and methodologies have been put in place and, and yet we've still, I don't know if we're still making all of the, of the right uh, lessons. So it's a, uh, it's very interesting to see how far we've come in the last 40 years, I guess, but then some, in some cases, how little we've actually evolved because, you know, I guess there's capitalism that says, right, we've got to ship this product to make our money on time. And that's, that's the way we are. So we have this, we have this constant sort of pendulum of uh, necessity, I guess, um, around, around the, the products that we ship and, uh, and the projects that we deliver on. One of one of the things that uh, I sort of realized over the years, you know, the, one of the problems with software is that it's soft. I guess that that, uh, that 
most of what I've, I've done have been working in, in, in things that were a mix of software and hardware. Uh, and when I look at what a hardware engineer has to do, the discipline they have to do, if you, you design a PC board and then you say, oh, gee, I found a problem. It's a, it's a major hassle to go back and design it, redesign it. Or with a chip, it's even a more major hassle to, to, to redesign it. Okay, so design techniques and testing and so forth that goes on there, it's very rigorous because it has to be. It's very expensive to make a change. People look at software and say, oh, you got a bug, change the line of code. Okay, that's easy. Software to many people looks like easy hardware. Okay, and it, in one sense it is, and in another sense it isn't, because it's so far more complex than most hardware is. Okay, and 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 a lot of, of especially management doesn't understand that, that because it's easy to change doesn't mean that it's therefore uh, it's going to be cheap to fix. Okay, <laughs> because changes ripple. Okay, uh, un unless software is is designed in a way that's very structured, like a piece of hardware is structured, that, so that so that your interfaces are all very strict and very strictly adhered to and partitioned properly and all that sort of thing, which requires a lot of upfront discipline, okay? Uh, and very often in software projects, well, let's start writing code. I, I think a good software project spends the first 30% or 40% of, of the development time planning and designing and not writing any code at all. And very few people have the discipline to do that to, in, in software projects, to, to spend that much time preparing to write the code. Uh, uh, the coding is the fun part, so let's get going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's very tempting just to jump in and write some code, but the reality yeah. is you're going to write some bad code if you don't think about it properly. Yeah. Just like writing a book, I guess, if you don't think about the beginning, the middle and the end, uh, you're going to come up with a really crummy book. So you've got to do that. You've got to have that discipline, right? That's yeah, very true. Yeah. Why well, software projects a lot, you know, suffer a lot from from uh, from being late or whatever because the, 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 that upfront discipline isn't usually adhered to, and and the, I, the the thought is I can do this really quickly, and as it goes on, you find you can't because problems arise. Uh, the, the things you didn't think about you know, because you didn't spend the upfront time getting it getting it properly prepared for sure yeah um okay uh, i think we're about time up but if you, is there anything else you wanted to add quickly before we, before we finish no up? i don't think so i, I, I appreciate it, the, 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 the chance to chat with you it's uh, it's been fun uh a chance to reminisce it's been <laughs> It was a long time ago now, thinking about it. I mean, this now we're talking about 40 years ago, okay? Uh, that, that's uh, that's uh, pretty incredible, the, the changes that have happened over, over those 40 years. My son is, a, is, is also a software engineer, um, maybe the best software engineer I've known. Uh, uh, and, uh, and seeing the kind of stuff that he works on these days is, uh, uh, is so much different. Uh, it, I, I'm jealous sometimes that I can't be still doing it, but the, uh, not for us old guys anymore. I run a website. That's what, that's, that's the most I can do these days. <laughs> that's fair enough. Yeah, I, I, it gets harder as the years go by. Yeah, but no, it's been it's been a real privilege to speak to you, Bert. I have thoroughly enjoyed um, hearing about you, the trials, the tribulations, but also you know the end the end uh, of it. You know, all kind of worked out in the end but uh, not without some real yeah. real hard work in the middle there so yep. yeah a, a real privilege to speak to you thank yeah. you very much thanks Al. i appreciate it too all right take okay. care all the best bye -bye. cheers bye thank you very much for watching this edition of al's geek lab thank you also to our sponsors on patreon our patrons on the top tier is Lyrian Alien and Fat Star Society, as well as our Super Tipper tier, Cognitive Gears, Doug Moore, Humdrum Conundrum, Jay Harris, Jesse Cousins, Meat Lotion, Paul Hughes and Robbie Whiting. Thank you so much for making this possible. If you'd like to become a Patreon, then head over to patreon.com forward slash Lab. Until next time, be excellent to each other.